Chapter 2. There was, in the offices of the National Child Care Agency in Westminster, a cabinet, and in the cabinet a red file marked Guardians, Character Assessment. In the red file there was a smaller blue file marked Maxim Charles. It read, C.P. Maxim is bookish, as one would expect of a scholar. Also, apparently generous, awkward, industrious. He is unusually tall, but doctors' reports suggest he is otherwise healthy. He is stubbornly certain of his ability to care for a female ward. Perhaps such things are contagious, because Sophie grew up tall and generous and bookish and awkward. By the time she turned seven, she had legs as long and thin as golf umbrellas, and a collection of stubborn certainties. For her seventh birthday, Charles baked a chocolate cake. It was not an absolute success because it had sagged in the middle, but Sophie declared loyalty that that was her favorite kind of cake because, she said, the dip leaves room for more icing. I like my icing to be extravagant. I am glad to hear it, said Charles, although the word is traditionally pronounced extravagant, I believe. Happy probably seventh birthday, dear heart. How about a little birthday Shakespeare? Sophie had a habit of breaking plates, and so they had been eating their cake off the front cover of a Midsummer's Night Stream. Now Charles wiped it on his sleeve and opened at the middle. Will you read me some Titania? Sophie made a face. I'd rather be Puck. She tried a few lines, but it was slow going. She waited until Charles was looking away, then dropped the book on the floor and did a handstand on it. Charles laughed. Bravo! He applauded against the table. You look the stuff that elves are made of. Sophie fell over into the kitchen table, stood up, and tried again against the door. Wonderful. You're getting better. Almost perfect. Only almost? Sophie wobbled and squinted at him upside down. Her eyeballs were starting to burn, but she stayed where she was. Aren't my legs straight? Almost. Your left knee looks a little uncertain. Anyway, no human is perfect. Nobody since Shakespeare. Sophie thought about that later in bed. No human is perfect, Charles had said, but he was wrong. Charles was perfect. Charles had hair the same color as the banister, and eyes that had magic in them. He had inherited his house and all of his clothes from his father. They had once been beautiful, razzle-dazzle Savile Row, 100% silk and were now 50% silk, 50% whole. Charles had no musical instruments, but he sang to her. And when Sophie was elsewhere, he sang to the birds and to the wood lice that occasionally invaded the kitchen. His voice was pitch perfect. It sounded like flying. Sometimes the feeling of the sinking ship would come back to Sophie in the middle of the night. And then she found that she needed desperately to climb things. Climbing was the only thing that made her feel safe. Charles allowed her to sleep on top of the wardrobe. He slept on the floor beneath her, just in case. Sophie didn't entirely understand him. Charles ate little and slept rarely, and he did not smile as often as other people. But he had kindness where other people had lungs, and politeness in his fingertips. If, when reading and walking at the same time, he bumped into a lamppost. He would apologize and check that the lamppost was unhurt. One morning a week, Miss Elliot came to the house to sort out any problems. Sophie could have said what problems, but she soon learnt to stay silent. Miss Elliot would look around the house, which was peeling at the corners, and at the spider webs in the empty larder, and she would shake her head. What do you eat? It was true that food was more interesting in their house than in the homes of Sophie's friends. Sometimes, Charles forgot about meat for months at a time. Clean plates seemed to break whenever Sophie came near them, and so he served roast potato chips on atlases of the world, spread open at the map of Hungary. In fact, he would have been happy to live on biscuits and tea and whiskey at bedtime. When Sophie first learned to read, Charles had kept the whiskey in a bottle labeled cat's urine, so that Sophie would not touch it. But she had uncorked the bottle and sipped it, and then sniffed at the underside of the cat next door. They were not at all similar, though equally unpleasant. We have bread, said Sophie, and fish in tins. 
You have what? said Miss Elliot. I like fish and tin, said Sophie. And we have ham. Do you? I've never seen a single slice of ham in this place. Every day. Or, she added, because Sophie was more honest than she found convenient. Definitely sometimes. And cheese? And apples? And I drink a whole pint of milk for breakfast. But how can Charles let you live like that? I don't think this can be good for a child. It's not right. They managed, in fact, very well. But Miss Elliot never quite understood. When Miss Elliot said right, Sophie thought she meant neat. Sophie and Charles did not live neatly. But neatness, Sophie thought, was not necessary for happiness. The thing is, Miss Elliot, said Sophie, the thing is, I don't have the sort of face that ever looks neat. Charles said I have untidy eyes, because of the flex, you see. Sophie's skin was too pale, and it showed blotches in the cold, and her hair had never, in her memory, been without knots. Sophie did not mind, though, because in her memory of her mother, she saw the same sort of hair and skin, and her mother, she felt sure, was beautiful. Her mother, she was sure, had smelt of cool air and soot, and had worn trousers with patches at the ankle. The trousers, in fact, were perhaps the beginning of the troubles. When Sophie was nearly eight years old, she asked Charles for a pair of trousers. Trousers? Is that not rather unusual for women? No, said Sophie. I don't think so. My mother wears them. Wore them, Sophie, my child. Wears them. Black ones but I'd like mine to be red. Um, you wouldn't prefer a skirt? He looked worried. Sophie made a face. No, I really do want trousers. Please? There were no trousers in the shops that would fit her, only the gray shorts that boys wore. And, good heavens, said Charles, you look like a mass lesson. So Charles sewed four pairs himself in brightly colored cotton and gave them to her wrapped in newspaper. One of them had one leg longer than the other. Sophie loved them. Miss Elliot was shocked and girls, she said, don't wear trousers. But Sophie insisted that they did. My mother wore trousers. I know she did. She used to dance in them when she played her cello. She can't have, said Miss Elliot. It was always the same. Women do not play the cello, Sophie, and you were much too young to remember. You must try to be more honest, Sophie. But she did. The trousers were black and grayish at the knee, and she wore black shoes. I remember. You are imagining things, my dear. Miss Elliot's voice was like a window slamming shut. But I promise I'm not. Sophie, I'm not. Sophie did not add, you potato-faced old hag. But she did very much want to. The problem was that a person could not grow up with Charles without becoming polite to their very bones. To be impolite felt to Sophie like wearing dirty underwear. But it was difficult to be polite when people talked about her mother. They were so very certain that she was making it up. And she was so very certain that they were wrong. Toenail eyes, whispered Sophie. Buzzard, I do remember. She felt a little better. Sophie did remember her mother, in fact, clear and sharp. She did not remember a father, but she remembered a swirl of hair and two thin cloth-covered legs kicked to the beat of wonderful music, and that wouldn't have been possible if the legs had been covered in skirt. Sophie was also sure she remembered very clearly seeing her mother clinging to a floating door in the middle of the channel. Everybody said, a baby is too young to remember. They said, you are remembering what you wish was true. She grew sick of hearing it, but Sophie remembered seeing her mother wave for help. She had heard her mother whistle. Whistles are very distinctive, no matter what the police said. Then she knew her mother had not gone down inside the ship. Sophie was stubbornly certain. Sophie whispered to herself in the dark every night, my mother is still alive and she is going to come for me one day. She'll come for me, said Sophie to Charles. Charles would shake his head. That is almost impossible, dear heart. Almost impossible means still possible. Sophie tried to stand up straight and sound adult. P. 
People believed you more easily if you were taller. You always say never ignore a possible. But my child, it is so profoundly improbable that it's not worth building a life on. It would be like trying to build a house on the back of a dragonfly. She'll come for me, said Sophie to Miss Elliot. Miss Elliot was more blunt. Your mother is dead. No women survive, she said. You mustn't allow yourself to get carried away. Sometimes it seemed difficult for the adults in Sophie's life to tell between carried away and absolutely correct but unbelieved. Sophie felt herself flushing. She will come, she said, or I'll go to her. No, Sophie, that is not how the world works. Miss Elliot was sure that Sophie was mistaken. But then Miss Elliot was also sure that cross-stitch was vital and Charles was impossible, which just showed that adults weren't always right. One day, Sophie found some red paint and wrote the name of the ship, the Queen Mary, and the date of the storm on the white wall of the house, just in case her mother passed by. Charles's face, when he found her, was too complicated for her to look at, but he helped her reach the high parts and wash the brushes afterwards. A case, he said to Miss Elliot, of the just-in-cases, but she's she is only doing as I have told her. You told her to vandalize your house? No, I have told her not to ignore life's possibles.